that's the deal, my dear. This is just a look at some of my favorite talks from last year and some memes. Others like the delicious, uh, well, and this one also the uh, asparagine 439. It's also been, has also been reported very recently, I believe uh, just last week. There's a recent manuscript discussing um, this mutation. I'm not very well aware of what's going on with this mutation, but I know it's been reported. And then we have the deletions that we haven't really covered today, but we have the that 69, 70 deletion and 144, 145. And there's actually a few new variants that just popped up around the United States. In this Furin cleavage site, what we're saying is this, you know, if it mutates into a perline here, uh, it might sort of be more kinked up. Um, and that might actually affect the way that the spike protein is working for, for this particular blue loop that's just right on the side there. Uh, in the red, that's just like a, a protein that might bind to the, the side. Um, but really, you know, we're looking at this whole furin cleavage site uh, being affected by that one mutation. Yeah, it's speculated that the presence of uh, proline at this site may introduce a favorable kink that just promotes the dynamic conformational change necessary for cleavage at the S1, S2 site. And um, yeah, that is governed by furin-like activities, but also by trypsin-like proteases and some cathepsins. And so, yeah, that's about the proline, but then there's all the other isolates um, that have found uh, histidine instead in that position. Mm -hmm. And um, okay. in that case, uh, the proto it's speculated that the protonation of histidine could also act as a conformational switch, uh, affecting the accessibility of the proteases. You know, it's uh, been happening in many places actually, so that uh, that points to a fitness advantage of the new virus, but it's not necessarily meaning that it will be worse or more deadly or anything like that. Yeah, and this is very far from the receptor binding domain uh, where we would typically be looking at mutations, uh, sort of along this region where it binds with ACE2. Uh, but for this case, it's actually on sort of the bottom and the side of the spike protein. Uh, and we can see that the 677 residue of interest uh, mutating around the United States, as well as other places around the world, uh, is located right here where we have this histidine residue. Right, it's not in the spike, uh, in, in the receptor binding domain. However, it's still very relevant because here's where the furin uh, may cleave and, you know, and separate this S1 and S2 subunits and therefore has uh, implications. Is that what we it's have kind of, red? Is that the furin? Yeah, that's right. That's the furin, yeah, that would bind in there. Yeah. We see some hydrogen bonding in there interacting with the spike. And uh, yeah, so this just mutation may affect the, the interaction there, yeah. So I'm talking about the N5... O one Y right now, yeah, that's that's the important mutation that's present in in most of the new uh, variants. Yeah, yeah that's, that's um uh, forty one. Right yeah, the five O one. Yeah, this this is a critical one, asparagine to tyrosine. So there's a few. Um, yeah, we can see. It so you're talking about over... this like tyrosine to tyrosine type of. Uh... Right. Daniel and Gotti, uh, it's always interesting to explore the spike. Um, you know, unfortunately, this virus is you know, still spreading, still mutating. So uh, stay tuned and we'll be you know, keeping on top of the latest mutations and letting you know what's really going on at the molecular level. Oh, sorry. Today I'm going to share some data about SARS-CoV-2 infection and persistence in intestinal tissues up to seven months after resolution of acute illness. Gastrointestinal symptoms represent the most common extrapulmonary manifestation of COVID-19, and viral RNA has been isolated from fecal samples of COVID-19 patients, which can persist longer than detection in nasopharyngeal swabs. Cell culture and organoid studies have demonstrated viral competence to infect intestinal tissue, but evidence of in vivo infection in humans is lacking. No, no. Based on this data and infection models in human organoid cultures, we decided to analyze biopsy tissue from patients with current or previous COVID-19 for the presence of virus, focusing on the duodenum and the ileum. We recruited 29 patients undergoing clinically indicated endoscopic procedures with a history of COVID-19 confirmed by PCR testing or serological testing. Biopsies were analyzed via immunofluorescence and or electron microscopy. The average age of these patients was 51 and a half years with a range from seven to 90 years old, 
um, and 65.5% of these patients were male. The average number of days from last positive nasopharyngeal swab was 51 days, and the average number of days from symptom onset to procedure was 56.6 days. Seven of the 29 patients were PCR positive within three days of the procedure. Most of these patients had mild disease during their acute COVID-19 illness, six had severe disease, and two had moderate disease. Three patients were asymptomatic and underwent testing due to a close contact exposure, two via PCR, and one several months after uh, exposure by serology. Eight of these patients had COVID-attributed GI symptoms defined as greater than one episode of nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea at the time of admission for hospitalized patients. And then for outpatients, the same three GI symptoms were only considered attributable to COVID if documented during the visit where the COVID test was ordered. We initially included abdominal pain as a COVID-19 attributable GI symptom, but decided it was too nonspecific given the comorbidities in our cohort. Aminofluorescence for viral nucleocapsid was performed using rabbit antisera against recombinant nucleocapsid protein from SARS-CoV-1. Immunofluorescence was performed on biopsies from 25 of the 29 patients, of which 12 had detectable antigen in the duodenum, the ileum, or both. Nucleocapsid in these images is green. Um, FCAM, which again is an epithelial marker, is in red, and nuclei are in blue. Representative duodenal staining is at the top, and ileal staining is shown down here. Antigen, when present, was only detected in the epithelium and was patchy, but tended to be more diffuse in the ileum as compared to the duodenum. 10 small bowel biopsies from 10 patients undergoing endoscopic procedures prior to the pandemic were also stained as controls. Electron microscopy or tomography was also done in 14 patients, uh, seven of which had presumptive viral particles um, as shown here. This inlet is a magnified version of this area here. Spike-like projections characteristic of coronaviruses are marked with the red dots. From this imaging, we noticed that the cells in which antigen or presumptive viral particles were identified appeared to have a goblet cell-like morphology. So we next sought to further define the epithelial subtypes with co-localizing viral products. This panel shows nu nucleocapsid again in green and MUC2 in red. MUC2 is an uh, intestinal mucin produced by goblet cells. And then nuclei are again in blue. Um, so there are scant nucleocapsid positive cells that are not positive for MUC2 shown by these arrows here, but the majority of them were MUC2 positive shown here. Viral association with goblet cells was also seen by electron tomography. This panel shows a tomographic reconstruction um, of goblet cells in both the duodenum and in the ileum with uh, presumptive virons uh, within these membrane bound compartments. And then here's our, our magnified images of the virons. To more definitively confirm that these viral particles are SARS-CoV-2, we began performing immuno-EM here. Um, so this panel shows one of these presumptive um, viral particles um, denoted by this asterisk, and then um, spike protein is the, are these dark um, black or brown um, dots surrounding. So despite detection of viral products, intestinal inflammation was mild or undetectable in most cases in our cohort. Only one patient had evidence of inflammation on endoscopy, and this was attributed to transplant rejection by pathology. 13 of the 29 patients had histologic signs of inflammation, such as scant neutrophils, shown here, um, or increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, shown here. 16 patients uh, in the cohort had completely normal intestinal uh, histology, shown here. Half of the patients with detectable viral products had histologically normal biopsies. There have been reports of so-called long COVID, a constellation of symptoms that persist in some patients after resolution of the acute infection. In our cohort, the average time from symptom onset to time of biopsy in the patients with detectable viral products was 47 days. Only four of these patients had GI symptoms associated with their acute COVID-19, and importantly, four patients where no viral products were detected had GI symptoms as well. One patient that had persistent GI symptoms returned for a repeat biopsy seven months after resolution of his acute illness and continued to have viral antigen present on two consecutive biopsies. This patient continues to have symptoms of unexplained weight loss and abdominal pain. One of the major limitations uh, of this study was small sample size. Additionally, this cohort of patients consists of hospitalized patients who tended to be closer to their acute illness and outpatients that tended to be further removed, um, both of which were scoped for clinically indicated uh, reasons, so not, specific for, um, not specifically for research. We only have follow-up biopsies on two of these patients, so most of the biopsies are just one snapshot in time. And because uh, positive staining is sparse, particularly in the duodenum, uh, we may have false negatives due to inadequate uh, biopsy sampling. 
So in summary, SARS-CoV-2 antigen and presumptive viral particles are present in small intestinal biopsies from COVID-19 patients. The majority of cells with detectable antigen in our cohort appear to be intestinal goblet cells, but this is an active area of investigation as the type of cell infected may be stage dependent. Despite the detection of viral products, inflammation is mild or undetectable in most cases. Detection of viral products did not correlate with GI symptoms in the acute setting in our cohort. Viral antigen continu can continue to be detected in intestinal tissue up to seven months following symptom resolution. More work is needed to understand the mechanisms and long-term implications of infection and persistence in intestinal tissues. We've begun recruiting uh, more patients, some of which are willing to be followed longitudinally so that we can start to address some of these things. Three, two, one, drop it. The viruses that infect you for a long time, like HIV and herpes viruses, right? But the acute ones like this are tough, as Matt said, because you got to get it. I mean, if you have 10 years to to uh, treat a, an infection, that's great. But if you have seven days, that's tough. We have acute viruses like flu, polio, rhinovirus, SARS-CoV-2. You get infected, you make an immune response, you clear the infection. You get infected with persistent viruses like herpes viruses, herpes simplex, Epstein-Barr virus. It doesn't get cleared, it remains with you forever. Why is that? Because those herpes viruses can antagonize immune responses so they're not cleared. And that's one of the main differences, in fact. I actually wondered how you felt about one of the sentences they had in the introduction <laughs> about this, where they say, in adults, there's increased recognition that the gut serves as a nidus for SARS-CoV-2. No, I think it avoids saying that it's reproducing there, right? It does, yeah. <laughs> well, they do it, say at the end, we can't prove that it's reproducing there. We need more work. And I think that's a fine way to put it, right? Uh, if they said the virus is reproducing there, that wouldn't be correct because we don't have that data, right? And if you remember, Paul B. Nash and Theodora Hatsianu had some suggestion that there's persistence of antigen in the gut in, in adults, right, from some some sampling that they had done. But I don't think there's any good proof that there's virus reproduction. So Anidus, I think, is okay. replicate efficiently in human cells about two years ago and finally the SARS-2 coronavirus about three months ago. So there's been an accelerating cross-species movement of these viruses uh, in the 21st century. The major drivers of coronavirus evolution include a regulated fidelity machine. This involves a protein called NSP14 shown here in blue which engages, engages the NSP12 RNA dependent RNA polymerase uh, shown here. The NSP14 uh, uh, 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease removes 3 prime mismatches from the growing template strand and provides a way for RNA proofreading. However, 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 and changes in the environment or protein protein interactions can alter the fidelity eff efficiency, providing uh, a mechanism for rapid evolution in changing environments. How did I never notice this before? 
I, I, I listened to this. I never noticed this before. In addition, coronaviruses undergo high-frequency RNA recombination, so that during the, the, the replication, as the polymerase is moving down the strand, template strand, the polymerase can fall off and bind to the template of a heterologous strand to produce chimeric recombinant molecules that have genetic material from each of the two parents. Next slide. The other major driver of evolution is the plasticity of the surface glycoprotein shown here in blue, and this is the actual structure that has been published uh, uh, some, uh, about two to three years ago. This S glycoprotein tolerates high rates of mutation. It can uh, it, uh, tolerate deletions and insertions that can alter tropism and antigenicity. Uh, the modular com um, uh, design of this spike like a protein allows modular evolution where component pieces can be exchanged between strains and this affects host range tissue tropism and transmissibility. We developed a reverse genetic platform, a DNA copy of the SARS coronavirus molecular clone. This is a mouse adapted strain and the little arrows here represent mouse adapted mutations. And here are related SARS viruses, SARS group 2B coronaviruses that have been discovered in bats. So our basic approach was to take the spike glycoproteins from these strains, like WIV1, or SHC014, WIV16, and replace the Urbani spike with these bat spikes. And when you do these, you find two type classes of viruses, that, uh, two, two classes of spike genes that exist within this group 2B coronavirus phylogenetic tree. Uh, WIV1, uh, WIV16, and SHC014 range from about 97 to 90% identical to uh, the SARS spike. And all of these can program efficient infection of primary human airway epithelial cells down here, which uh, have been obtained from uh, discarded lungs from transplant recipients. In addition, the ones in the box can use the human ACE2 receptor, just like SARS. And uh, then we synthesized the full-length genomes and recovered the full-length viruses, and they had the same properties in terms of their capacity to replicate in primary cells. <laughs> the genome organization of the Wuhan coronavirus, uh, or the SARS-2 coronavirus, is shown up here. These are the replicates. The, the, the rectangles in green are the structural proteins of the virus, and the uh, boxes in gray are uh, lux luxury ORFs. And you can see that SARS is, basically has the identical genome organization. The spike like a protein of SARS-2 and SARS both bind uh, the uh, human ACE2 receptor. There's the uh, ACE2 receptor up here in green and the, SAR and the SARS are the SARS-2 receptor binding domains and the spike like a protein down here. And you can see there's a very nice interface between SARS-2 and the human ACE2 receptor. In fact, it makes a better, uh, co better contact with the human ACE2 receptor as compared to the original SARS uh, coronavirus strain. There are 14 contact interface residues in the spike of the receptor binding domain that bind human ACE2 molecules. And up here are the SARS and the SARS-related strains and the high-risk bat strains that are shown here. Everywhere there's a green residue, it's highly conserved. If it's light green, it's partially conserved. As it turns to red, it becomes more, um, uh, more deleterious in terms of being able to engage the human ACE2 receptor. And all these strains here can efficiently use human civet bat and mouse ACE2 receptor. Even the SHC014 strain that has seven to 14 differences. Here's the receptor binding domain of the, Wuhan, the SARS-2 viruses from a Wuhan. You can see that it has eight of 14 contact residues in common with SARS. It uh, encodes a couple residues that are common with the SHC014 strain, and then it has a large number of unique residues encoded within its receptor binding domain. In contrast, strains that are low risk have deletions within the receptor binding domain, as shown here and as shown here. <clears throat> I mentioned that these were anagenically, the spikes were anagenically quite different with up to about 22% uh, variation. Here's the SARS spike shown here. Anywhere there's a green residue indicates variation, and you can see that the early, uh, middle, and late phase uh, 2003 epidemic strains were almost identical. They are very closely related to civet and raccoon dog strains. Here is the intermediate host, as well as the WIV16 virus, which is its closest relative. But as you move more towards uh, the uh, anagenically distinct, the, 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 the strains with more genetic variation, you can see that the SARS-2 strain is significantly encodes a significantly uh, increased amount of antigenic variation on its surface as compared to the original SARS strain. 
there's a variety of uh, uh, vac vaccine complications with SARS. Um, the first problem is that vaccine efficacy in general was reduced in age populations, and that can reduce performance. The uh, heterologous uh, group 2B SARS coronaviruses that exist within the zoonotic pool can vary by as much as 35%. And that means that vaccine strains that are tailored to a single serotype within the group 2B coronaviruses will likely uh, not provide uh, protection against the more variable strains. Um, of most concern is that uh, the original SARS uh, uh, doubly inactivated vaccines that were purchased by the NIH and adjuvanted with alum caused a Th2 immune pathology after vaccination, especially in age populations. In some cases, these vaccines actually increased mortality following challenge. And they occurred not only with a doubly inactivated vaccine, but also with adjuvanted spike glycoprotein vaccines. Now, most of these adjuvants drove a Th2 immune pathology. So if, uh, although SARS coronavirus, again, is quite different in its spike glycoprotein, uh, using the right adjuvant that drives the Th1 response might be absolutely critical for uh, performance. There's also some evidence of enhancing antibodies, although there's some controversy around this that has been shown in primates and in cell culture. Whether this is a major problem in vaccine design, uh, we don't know. So um, these are uh, things, uh, these are concerns that uh, the vaccine community is going to have to address as we move forward with uh, vaccine. We received uh, quite a few questions. Uh, we will try to triage them to the specific speakers uh, after this session. But Dr. Barrick, the uh, first question is, uh, would it be possible to develop a serologic test for SARS-CoV-2? Uh, thank you, it's, and it's a pleasure to be here to answer questions for the audience. Um, the simple answer to that question is yes. SARS-2 has extensive variation in the N-terminal domain of the spike like a protein that can be used as a type specific response. Antibodies are also targeting that region. And so um, a simple uh, serologic test based on the first 300 amino acids, 500 amino acids of the spike glycoprotein protein would be quite sensitive and specific uh, for the uh, SARS-2 coronavirus. Question is, does a person develop immunity after surviving a coronavirus infection? Uh, and can a person who has had an episode um, get reinfected or have more than one episode? So uh, there's interesting data on that from both SARS and uh, SARS-2 infections and in MERS infections. There were some sporadic reports of individuals who seroconverted with MERS and then um, returned to baseline after infection, uh, including some who were RT-PCR positive. So the uh, possibility for this happening uh, is it, it certainly is possible, although I do not think it's frequent. There is also some evidence of chroni a chronically infected MERS patient, um, although there was only a single one to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. In the case of SARS-2, there are sporadic reports in China of individuals who um, uh, experienced an acute infection, uh, were released after they'd resolved infection, and then reportedly have become infected again. But I don't think there's anything that's been officially published. Thank you. The third question is, uh, what about reservoirs in the body uh, for this uh, virus similar to, for example, in HIV or Ebola? Any information on uh, any reservoirs? At this uh, time, there's no, there's, at least I'm not aware of any known reservoirs for either SARS, MERS, or SARS-2 infection in human hosts. Uh, viral persistence, viral genome persistence can last quite a, quite a while in sputum samples. Um, but whether those are associated with replicating genomes or not is, is certainly not clear. Uh, uh, of course, part of the problem was there were insufficient samples of SARS globally to um, uh, follow sufficient cases to ask questions along the lines of uh, long-term persisting uh, viral genomes and where they may persist. Uh, certainly this outbreak is of uh, sufficient scope um, to reveal those types of, uh, of uh, rare infection events, uh, much like they did with Ebola. We realized that what we had seen as potentially the way that variants of concern arise. So these new multi-mutated viruses only described in December by us and others, um, really were not known when we started this work on looking at individual cases. And so the jigsaw just came to the came together at the end of last year. 
And I'll tell you why I think that's the case. Vaguely philosophical question here. So I'm I'm struck by the pattern of emergence of mutation and then decay. I mean, mm. so that was you know that, that was the default. Mm. Um, but so many of these mutations do seem to provide clear selective advantage, like the sixty nine seventy mutation uh, deletion. Um, mm. Why why do you think that that things don't tend to fixate until it looks like his final two weeks? Um, you know, why, why do you think the deletion arose and then decayed? Yeah, it's a, that's an important question. Um, I think it tells you that the virus is optimized for doing its thing in general. And when there are antibodies around, you disturb it. And it may evolve escape mutations, but it's still probably less fit than the wild type. But then you have to ask the question, well, why did the wild type not come back? Why did this 240 yeah. mutation come back? Then why did this come up? And I think there are a number of contributing factors. One is the illness in the individual. This virus had generated, set up a chronic COVID infection with very high inflammation, you know, C-reactive proteins in the 200s, 300s, you know, very high swinging temperatures. And that will have effects that we have we cannot model. Um, and potentially that also places selection pressure on the virus for certain viruses to persist and, and flourish in that environment. So um, it, it it, it is hard to understand how the, you know, why the, the 6970 did, went away because we know that the 6970 is now transmitting in humans. Um, but again, transmitting between well, you know, physiologically well people is a very different thing to trying to replicate in a person who has a temperature of 40 and, um, mm. uh, you know, a huge inflammatory response, uh, even though they don't have a great immune system, there's still a, a lot going on, a lot of um, uh, disturbance metabolically and physiologically going on. So I, it would be great to know if this would happen in a, a well person or not. Yeah, in a different just, circumstance. Just so counterintuitive. So I, I'm I'm a protein engineer by training, and every protein we optimize. I mean, no protein sits remotely near its you know its sequence, uh, its fitness maximum. Um, right. Just hard hard to believe that it would be you know perfectly tuned. Yeah. Well, you see, the other thing I didn't mention actually is I did mention it in the talk is is this thing about anatomical distribution and populations. So as I was mentioning, I was saying we just sampled everything through the nose and throat. Whereas this, yeah. this disease was affecting the heart, the lungs, you know, the spleen, and there was going to be a balance of, there's going to be a, there's a, there's a, there's a war going on inside, you know, in terms of which variants are going to win out. And you're only getting a very brief glimpse or snapshot of that. And that's what I think was most yeah. valuable about this, because I think what this is telling you is that is a reflection of different anatomically distributed virus populations mm -hmm. that do mix at some level it, for some reasons. And this is the result yeah. of that. Yeah, I think it's so cool that you guys did the long read sequencing because I mean you need that to get at the viral ensemble. Which well, in, yeah, different. we did talk about that, but we did both because I wasn't sure whether the long read would do the trick. And I mean, we did compare them, and I because I thought Illumina would be because I thought we would be dealing with very low population abundance, like you know one percent, two percent, three percent, and so we compared in this figure, um, long and short reads, you know, nanopore versus Illumina. Illumina, you can see that the proportion with certain mutations, we've taken four million mutations. And in general, they these things kind of correlate, you know, the orange is high in both cases, you know what I mean? But here, for example, there's a discrepancy for the deletion. Um, it appears that the, the deletion was called differently by the two methods. So uh, unclear as to which was correct. And um, we did do single genome amplification after the reviewers asked for it. And I'm glad they did because mm. we, we got our SGA, which is basically taking doing a separate PCR, diluting out your template, and then looking at single genomes amplified showed us that there were that this was broadly reflective of what was going on very very you know that last that one on the really long branch that i spent a lot of time on the reason i did that is because that virus was hang it didn't just it wasn't a, a super infection from someone else it was there all along mm -hmm. uh, and it arose or it arose from the main population but it was not it didn't become evident until 100 days in when it was given some opportunity and it, in my view it was probably replicating in like a kind of niche area of the body Mm -hmm. um in wow. some particular cell type or in a particular compartment and somehow it got an advantage yeah yeah um hey ravi we just wanted to check your time so it's six minutes yeah i think probably need to, to probably wrap up with what, maybe one more question okay Sorry. um fantastic um um what was the nature of the mutations that you saw in response to remdesivir treatment i mean I, I i would assume that they would arise in rdrp but i thought your plot was showing that they were spike mutations 
well, we did see an RDRP mutation actually in during Remdesivir. Um, it was 157, I think V157L. We because we don't have assays for testing um, RDRP mm. in vitro, we have not pursued it. And to be honest, the, the Remdesivir didn't do anything anyway. So I mean, <laughs> sure. It doesn't work. So, I mean, but then you could say the same about neutralizing antibodies. But I think the, po the, the point there is that the emergent mutations are a problem mm -hmm. for vaccines and, you know, such like. Yeah. Well, you wow. Well, about Ravi, thanks for the what your understanding is of the number of patients infected with COVID that will develop these long term symptoms. So your choices range from 5% to 75%, or you can just say, I don't know. And I'm afraid I don't have music for this, although Mike Sarr could maybe sing to us while we're doing it. But um, I'll just wait for Stephanie to tell me when we have an answer. OK, so I am honestly a little bit surprised by this. I thought most people would say they don't know. But uh, some people are apparently persuaded by some of the reports that they've read. I believe the correct answer is I don't know because we don't actually know yet. Um, as to what the true epidemiology is, but we're probably uh, those that selected those middle numbers are probably about in the range. I think that my point is here, this is unlike some other sequelae of uh, infectious diseases that we see, so-called chronic Lyme disease or even chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, myalgic encephalomyelitis, in that it's not just a constellation of symptoms. There's real pathology here that you can see under the microscope and definite organ damage and not just in older people. So what about lung damage? Similar spectrum of uh, manifestations of long COVID from a chronic cough to actual fibrotic lung disease, bronchiectasis, and even vascular disease. Obviously, the thromboembolic phenomenon can play a role here as the lungs are a common site for that. And so is there a question of, is there going to be an increase in premature COPD and or pulmonary fibrosis as a result of patients with long COVID who have pulmonary complications. And so these are the pulmonary sequelae and what you might see when you do pulmonary function testing, you know, in more than half decreased DLCO and a high proportion with radiographic evidence of interstitial thickening and fibrosis. And this is from a cohort study that was done in China. Um, so again, uh, potentially compounded, but if you combine this with the cardiovascular complications, we could have patients with uh, significant morbidity going forwards from a fairly young age. COVID and the brain has a, another spectrum of, of complications uh, after the acute infection in the long COVID period from persistent headaches, dizziness, trouble concentrating, what people refer to as this brain fog where they just can't think straight, to frankly frank uh, confusion, hallucinations, and in the most severe cases, a uh, stroke or other embolic event. So pathogenesis, again, uh, the question is, is this because of inflammation? Is this because of direct viral invasion of the brain? There's obviously a role of hypoxemia in those with more severe COVID infection. So is this something that we're going to be dealing with in some of our infected patients going forwards? I also wanted to include briefly anosmia because I think this is one of the probably about the only really sort of pathognomonic uh, sign that we have of COVID, this loss of smell that so many patients report and that it seems to be very particular for this infection as opposed to other coronavirus infections or uh, respiratory infections in general. Turns out it's actually not a neurological complication of COVID after all, because it's, uh, it's due to actual viral infection of the olfactory epithelium as opposed to the olfactory nerve. So kind of a bit of a teaser there, but not really a neurologic complication. But here are some that actually are that appear during the acute phase and also the persistent phase, some of which were newly developed after the acute infection had resolved. Just kind of make they, they have a camera, they're pointing at shooting at stuff, and they're like, okay, well, we'll figure it out later, but finally we've got this great technology, let's just, just find, look at every, as much as we can. S3 is the next one? Um, yeah, I moved to S3 because they talk about S2 like closer to the oh, next no, that, figure. That makes sense. Okay, so and S3 <laughs> is doing some, let's see what. S3 is doing. Looking at the outer membrane of the double membrane vesicle, and they're seeing little dense, electron dense regions, which uh, density here would be black, yeah. right? So things that are electron dense are, are black. So, they're absorbing the electrons and not bouncing back into the detector. Yeah. <laughs> um, and here they see stuff. They see stuff. That's all they're saying. I mean, that these, these aren't smooth membranes with nothing on them. They're full of proteins of some sort. Yeah. I mean, 
Yeah, so they basically said that, oh, the identity of these different identities cannot be ascertained. It is worth noting that numerous viral and health proteins associate with coronavirus replication. Organelles. So they basically say that, okay, we don't know what they are. They could, it could be from the host. They could be from a virus. They could be from aliens. We yep. don't know. So maybe if they had enough images, they could reconstruct what the shape was and then try to match it against yeah, other shapes. That, that, but that's like a needle. That could be a needle in the haystack because like how many structures do we really know of everything that's possible in the host and the virus, right? We may not know that much. We may not, but we may be able to make guesses. I mean, we do know structures and if we have a matching yep, software that's, true. that's good enough, then yeah. this, it could potentially be something mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah, uh, with enough information, you could do label-free identification of things. <laughs> but we're, we're, we're nowhere near that. That's like a pipe tree, yeah. right? Like now, if I wanted to know what that is, I would need an antibody raised to that molecule, and I would need to attach a little piece of gold to the end of the antibody. And then the next time I image it, after it's been soaked with the antibody, I would see, oh yeah, those things, they got tagged by this piece of gold. Mm. Uh, so next one is figure S4, where we get to see... Uh, the DSRNA, apparently, they, they look, well, they look focusing yes. more on the inwards on, and looking at these filamental mm -hmm. structures, which I think come out mm -hmm. most cl clearest in, like, uh, Supplemental C. So usually, Absolutely. This, you, you get one representative image, and they go, oh, it looks a bunch of other images, and they also look the same. Whereas here, when they go, yep. no, no, well, look, I made this, I made this, look yes. at this. Yes, I mean, I, you know, it's like, it's really good, because, like, that's, that's a criticism that can get levied at microscopy yeah. papers, right? Is that like, you showed us representative, but how do we really know, right, what it is? Yeah. And, I mean, they didn't give us, so back in the TEM days, I know that people would quantify from TEM fields. They'll say, like, across this many TEM fields, we saw this many mitochondria or something, right? And, like, that's how they got it, certain... Uh, numbers yeah. even. And they give us a sense. Like, I think in the last one it said like approximately 60% of the things we saw, right, like fell into this category or something yeah. like that. And like, <clears> even, <throat> there are like some chat, so tom tomography can only give you so much because uh, there's a point where you tilt the image and you can like, and then the thickness almost doubles, at which point, like yeah. 60%, which point you get very little data. Yeah, so I mean, most of this is really confirming what we were seeing in one, right? Like, there is double membrane vesicles filled with what we think is the viral. Um, uh, RNA and covered in proteins, yep. and even inside, there's also proteins associating with these with these strands. Oh, and the fact that it's such a regular gap kind of is, is interesting because you, that's not necessarily a thing that is set in stone for double membranes. That they could like yeah, you know, the, the gaps could be really wide. It's like you have two plastic bags inside of each other, and they don't have to be the, the fact that there's a regular length. Is... And, and that's what they suggest in B, right? They actually see little gray spots that bridge that yes. gap, and they're so they're hypothesizing that that's like a stopper of some sort, right, to keep the distance equivalent. And that's something we see in, or that's something we see in bacterial yes. membranes, right, like in gram negatives. Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially <clears> like <throat> around cell division and and place like that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, C is, yeah. is is particularly interesting because that that literally shows the pores holding the membranes together. The comparison as well is to show that this is something that happens in lots yes. of coronaviruses. Yes, yes, yeah. So I mean, relating it back, because you know, that's that's the hot topic these days, right? They're yeah. doing this to tell us about <laughs> our novel coronavirus friend. Um, what they see in the mirroring one seems to mirror that. The, if your internal innate <clears throat> immune system to a cell sees double strand RNA, it goes, okay, time to put the self-destruct of the virus. It's like, no, no. And then based on that, building off of that, they create a 3D model. That, it, mm -hmm. and that looks really great. It's like spinning around and it's all, we're going to yeah. be going through a lot of like <laughs> slides that uh, show bubbles with lots of grains in them that uh, that could be different structures and also like I mean yeah. looking at the detail so luckily uh, figure S1A is the one that's coming up now so they've got these handy one arrows that point to all the kind of connections the organelle the bubbles organelles. gosh yeah, yeah. I, we should talk about what they call them double membrane vessels slash replication organelles so double membrane slash vessels. So I think mm -hmm. uh, before this we, we thought that they were double membrane vesicles but these tubes that link them together I don't think have been observed before uh, strikingly thus far unreported tubular connections reaching up to 300 nanometers uh, and yeah they're uh, there's really there's really long yeah, ones really is long what ones. they have seen. connected to all sorts of different parts of the internal structure of the cells they don't say where those other oh I see uh, between the ER and the DMVs yes. the endoplasmic reticulum B and M um, so this, so I'll start off with C because I think I'm I did make a quick gif for, mm. uh, for uh, figure 2D to but oh, nice. But it focuses in on that pore and looking at those weird yep. structures around it. Or even like you see the double membrane here, right? Yeah. It could be, we don't know what it is, electron dense stuff. Mm. Um, and so like you can see it's rigid, right? Like there's nothing in between the membranes, right? That's white. We never really see anything there. But outside in the lumen and the outer membrane, there's all sorts of stuff sometimes it's floating around. So it's like a light gray. And as you get closer, you can even see other density areas. And I think we'll, we'll discuss it more like later in the paper. And based on that, they've, they've built this uh, 
model of the, of how the yep. how it works. Yeah. By looking at <laughs> almost like looking building up a, a top down image and then scaling it down at different pop points. It's a really nice way. I like these three D images. Um, what it doesn't communicate to you is that uncertainty, yeah. right? So in the gray, you can get a sense that things that are light gray are more uncertain, and things that are dark, like they aren't as as much. Um, oh, I love this gift. This is really great. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, you can and uh, but but easy for the human brain to understand is like a three D model. Yeah. So they like they choose like a cutoff point of like darkness, and they say that stuff is that stuff is there, yeah. <laughs> and then they and then they fill it in for us so we can see what that looks like. like slice J or something. There's like a lot of density. Yeah. That some of that density might be membrane, right? And like the way that it kind of J and K, the way that it curves off. There's a curvature to this whole thing, yeah. right? So that it's also sort of it can even show us that in these images. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, okay. So. Uh, oh, yeah. I can do the next movie as well. So the next movie. Yeah. So. Is, oh, here go. Go, sorry. No, you can go ahead. Uh, you can explain. Oh, I was just gonna say, like, you know, from this, from this um, tom tomogram, sub tomogram, right? Because it's just they're focusing on this one thing, average version. You really get a sense of the shape, right? Like that on the outer side, there are these flanges, right? On the luminal side, there's like nothing much. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then there's a channel that goes all the way through, and they can measure all those distances. Right, 14 nanometers from the center to the edge. Um, it's about 13 nanometers long. Um, tiny, tiny things to be looking at. <clears throat> yeah. Um, uh, so this is, the GIF. <laughs> or this is the movie that they gave us. It's the same as your GIF, kind of, right? Yeah. That it's smoothly moving through the sections from luminal, from outer side to luminal side. No, from lumen to outside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It goes out. Yeah. Um, they did the work. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and then figure three A, where you're looking at. Uh, about the coding, so they don't know what the pore is, but they try to predict what's in it by looking at coding sequences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they want to know. Yeah. And actually, I guess that we didn't really touch on that last figure in um, six AD. But six AD, like because they know the shape and the general volume of things from these tomographic images, um, they make you can make assumptions on how heavy everything yeah. is, <laughs> right? Uh, because you know how much space it takes up. You know, like the density of a protein, <laughs> um, and so you come up with some estimation. And from that, we know the coding sequences of everything in the coronavirus genome, which gives us sequence structure that also gives us estimates, well, actually gives us a more precise weight for everything. And uh, from all of that, they think that it might be this NSP3, I think, is that what NSP they think it is? Yes. Uh, let me double check this, because, it, because the thing is, um, uh, what, what was NSP? Uh, Delta two GFP, yeah, it's NSP three. They think that NSP three is part of the, part of the pore, yes. at least. Yes, that's right. <laughs> right? Um, they're not sure all the parts, but because because of the size of NSP three and the fact that it has these transmembrane domains, mm -hmm. right? That both and that they have regions on both yeah. sides. That's a good candidate for something that embeds into um, into a double membrane and that is on both sides. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's move yeah. on. Let's see what else we got. Oh, the, the um, next movie. Uh, so uh, I can transition to that. So, yeah, but this movie is pretty simple, actually. It's, I think, two images flickering back and forth, yeah. uh, just so that we can see that difference map a little bit easier, if you don't believe them. Yeah, no, it's like, don't <laughs> you don't. better, worse. Better, worse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that definitely makes a, the point a bit uh, more apparent. Uh, let's uh, move over to the next one, figure S8. Uh, and I've gone cross-eyed. Oh, um, uh... uh, yeah. More pores. More pores. <laughs> right. it's just... More pores. Um, yeah, they show us a lot of different things. I think now they're really trying to look at uh, maybe things that could associate with the pores. Yeah. Right. They're kind of pointing out like, oh look, sometimes there's like a little bit extra out here, and like in the subtomogram, that's gonna just show up as like like light gray, yeah. like uncertainty, right? Like we don't know because it's not in every picture. But when you take a human look to it, you're like, oh yeah, well, sometimes like one side looks longer than the other, and sometimes there's um like like strand like things and coming out of the bottom. I yeah. think that's what they're also Chain -like pointing to here. Uh, associating with the mm -hmm. prongs. And a lot of assembly cases are reminiscent of helical coronavirus RNT, so ribonuclease pro pro uh, proteins. So. Um, like, for example, when people see things that have like collared rims like that, they're often thought of as association, like assembly points, yeah. right? Where other proteins latch on, and that's where you start getting more complicated machinery to, like, I don't know, do something. Yeah. Speaking <clears throat> uh, of nine, it's like where you're actually seeing stuff, seeing virus particles being assembled inside. Yeah. So <laughs> this is quite a neat, uh, a nice surprise. Yeah. So. So this is not in the, this, these are not on the DMVs themselves, right? I think yeah. these are just other sections where they are seeing, uh, yeah, viral particles being created. Um, so that, I guess they want to say that it happens in close proximity to each other, yeah. right? Like these DMVs and viral assembly, like they're not, you know, in distant parts of the cell, they're happening in a in an area, a section. Yeah. Okay. Which I mean, this is, I mean, I just love this view of biology. First of all, it obviously 
it happen we know in biology there's going to be like local regions but it just makes everything so com like so much more complicated because the biochemical view is it happens in the cell but like beyond that you don't know <laughs> and then here it's like there's a region in the cells where we're seeing dmvs and viral replication like it's this zone that's getting hijacked yeah, yeah. like viruses aren't alive yet we are seeing them making their own cell organelles that are specific to, <laughs> uh, 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 to, to viruses and then we've got uh them like assembling each other and like almost doing all these biological things inside the cell that you wouldn't really suspect them of because the usual story is like yeah. oh the virus puts their dna and and our silly like machinery just like puts it together for them but this actually exactly shows the virus is taking a much more active role mm -hmm.